Hi, Nathan. Welcome to Landscape Photography World. How are you going? Doing really good. Thanks, Grant. How are you going today? Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. It's been a fairly chill day today. Uh, dog sitting for my daughter. Yeah. <laughs> It does sound like a pretty chill day. I uh, myself. Uh, you give him a feed and run him around a little bit and he sleeps for the rest of the day, which is pretty good, which means I can get on with things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sounds like a good deal. <laughs> Enough about me and the dog sitting. How did you get started in photography and in particular, why landscape photography? My story is a little bit different in the sense that it didn't actually start with landscape photography. So everyone asked me how long it's been that I've been shooting and I never know the exact answer, but I think it's been about probably 12 or 13 years since I got my first camera. Sure. And I was actually drawn to macro photography wow. and photos of jumping spiders particularly. So there's a photographer in America called Thomas Shahan who takes yep. like absolutely incredible macro photos. And I think on Facebook one day, I was just like scrolling through Facebook and I saw this photo and I was like, wow, this, this is incredible. I was like, what, what on earth is this? And I started like scrolling through his stuff and I was like, this is amazing. And then I like followed him on Instagram and I was like, wow, this is just, I want to do this. I was like, this is it's so intriguing that the detail that he captured for these little like spot spiders and dragon bit, uh, dragonflies and all different sorts of little arthropods. And I was like, yeah. I've got to do this. So probably about a week after I first saw that, I went out and bought my first camera, bought a macro lens for it. And then the journey started probably weeks of just, taking really average macro photos and as time got on started trialing different things and then just fell in love with landscape photography like just switched i still do a little bit of macro photography at the moment but predominantly i just love getting out watching a sunset or a sunrise or just capturing the night sky and just soaking up that moment in time that for me i feel a lot of people probably don't pay attention to mm -hmm. And so then I well, found there's not a lot of people out. At no. Hour. no. I know when I go to the beach, I might see, or oh, if I'm lucky, half a dozen swimmers in a rock pool here in Sydney. Yeah. And that's and that's in a metropolis, what, five and a bit million people. Exactly. And Adelaide's obviously a lot smaller. But it's, for me, I find it really intriguing because I'll go out and I'll see this amazing sunset and these all these colours and I'll look around. And the few people that are out, like sure, a few of them are pulling out their phones and taking photos. But a lot of them just keep walking. Yeah. People like just driving. And then I think to myself, like people are at home watching TV when you could be out mm -hmm. enjoying this weather or enjoying the light. And so for me, landscape photography is all about capturing that beauty and then sharing it with the people that don't stop to appreciate it in the hopes that then they'll go out and appreciate it. Yeah. Which is really, really difficult at times because I think some of the tools that we have or some of the, the ways of sharing images, people don't really see or appreciate at times yeah yeah definitely in terms of the learning macro I'm, I'm interested in because there's quite a bit of technical skill that you need to put together to build up a really good macro image how did you go about learning that is that just youtube and trial and error or were you yeah. doing something a little bit more formal no, you, you, every, everything, so all my photography is YouTube reading and then trial and error. So mm -hmm. nothing is, I've no done no formal training. I've just spent countless hours just out and about taking photos. But that's what I learned best by doing. Yeah. So I'll watch a few videos to understand a few things, like maybe how to build like a softbox to be able to attach to my flash yep. instead of going out and buying one. But the majority of it is literally just, all right, let's go out, let's take a photo, let's see what it looks like. All right, how can I perfect that? And then I'll right. come back and I'll, I'll go out again. And then building like a macro rig is also part of the fun because you can get a macro lens, which is one-to-one. -one. Yep. I've played around with reversing lenses to get different magnification okay. and then also like extension tubes as well yeah, to then yeah. get greater magnification to be able to play around and then just literally just trial and error and crawling around on the ground looking for little spiders and, and bugs and stuff and then them scurrying away and just being frustrated that I found one and then it's, it's disappeared. <laughs> Your subject wouldn't stand still. No, luck, luckily, like, jumping spiders are actually really curious creatures. Yeah. Right. And a lot of people are scared of spiders, but they're actually, when they see some, not all, but they'll be more curious about, okay, what are you doing 
Mm. And why are you interested in me? And so they will pose for photos. Yeah. And they just I don't know, they just got these really unique personalities and like quirks and facial expressions. And I probably sound like crazy to be talking no, about no, spiders no, like this. No, I'm no, like, no. I'm, I'm smiling thinking about them because I've, <laughs> I, I think back to photos that I've taken and I'm like, I just remember that spider just being like, I see you taking photos of me. I'm, I'm putting on a little bit of a show for you. <laughs> They might um, be looking at it themselves uh, as a reflection in the lens, maybe. Pro- probably that too. And like the beauty about jumping spiders, and, and predominantly the ones that I love are the peacock jumping spiders, yeah. and which are the ones that are known for putting up their backs and then dancing side to side for the female mate. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're probably the spider that I, I, I've searched for the longest. And it took me three and a half years to finally find one in Adelaide. Wow. They're just there's a lot of jump, there's spiders everywhere. There's spiders yeah. in the house now. They're, they're like they're everywhere. But these peacock jumping spiders in Adelaide are super rare, mm. and they're only in small little pockets of the state. And I remember the the first day I saw, I finally found one. I was like shaking. I was like literally, my friends like, what's, what's going on? You don't understand what this is. And he was like, it's just a spider, man. He's just let it go. I'm like, <laughs> no, I'm, I want to take photos of this thing. Yeah. So I, I yeah, a bit of a a spider geek before. Before I came on, I was actually wearing one of my pajama tops, which is, it's actually got a jumping spider on the front of it. And it's a shirt that Thomas Shahan had actually designed. Nice. And so I've got it, but it's falling apart slowly because I've had it for, yeah, probably 10 or 12 years now. Wow. Um, but I was like, oh, I can't wear that on this. <laughs> it's fair enough. I don't really use the video very much. Uh, oh. I'm thinking about whether or not I start releasing some of these as videos on uh, on YouTube or not. At the moment, yeah. I just do the audio on YouTube, but you never know. We, we might we might see you. Uh... Maybe. <laughs> so I, I guess taking those lessons from macro, how did you translate some of that learning into what you're doing with your landscape work? Probably just the trial and error mm. because you, you go out, and, and and macro is probably it, it, it's really complex in terms of the lighting, the angles, the lenses, it, it, the, even the the focusing is is super like because you're working with such shallow depths of fields and these spiders can be a few millimeters. So taking probably some of those those learning skills from the macro of just the struggles with you know I guess it's different in the sense that the environment you're dealing with a much larger field, but mm-hmm. just the trial and error of, okay, well, where do I focus? Where do I want my my, my subject to be in, in the image or the focal point of the image to be and just playing around. So moving around, trying different compositions and then just really, I think just trial and error like really is just shooting, seeing if it looked good, if it, if it felt right as well is a big thing for me. Cool. So what is it that you think you're chasing most in your photography? What is it that you're thirsty for? That's an interesting question. For me, I always like to think that I'm chasing the light. Mm. The, the light is what I love the most. So when you're watching a sunset and the light is continuously changing as the sun's setting or the sun's rising and you see just different parts of a scene, whether it's like the jetty as, as the sun is setting and you see the light just changing across and, and lighting up the textures of the wood. Yeah. That, that's what I'm always chasing, just those intricate little moments where the light is just perfect. Yeah. And everything just flows together. And if it's a sunset that's got no clouds, there's, there's going to be a bit of a glow. And so then that glow will transfer onto, like, again, if it's a jetty you're going to see that along the side of the jetty or if depending on where it is, it's just going to light up certain parts of the scene. And I'd say that's what I'm chasing is that light and those fleeting, because it's it's only momentarily, like momentarily there. And then it, it stops and it's gone until the next day potentially. And some of my favourite images, if I think back to, they are literally very brief moments where the light if it peeked through a cloud and it was just perfect for a second and i was there just to be able to take a picture uh, it would probably be what i'm chasing the most yeah fantastic do you have goals in your photography 
And if so, what are they? I, in, in terms of goals, I have a few and, and they're predominantly just mainly about just capturing certain locations. Mm-hmm. So I have a, 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 I have different areas like New Zealand is, is top of my list and I'm heading there in just over a month's time. Nice. And so my goal, my goals are basically just to capture images in places that I've seen online mm-hmm. and capture my own, like my own images that have a feeling of me in them. Yep. So that, that would probably be one of my main goals is just getting out and traveling more. I'm also very driven by the, the, by personal growth and, and just improving in what I'm doing. So I, I've for years have always looked at my images and been like, this is a good image, but what could be done better? And so I'm continuously working on how do I take the image better in the first place? How do I post-process the image better sure. to just give more emotion in it? Mm-hmm. Um, and then if I think about like probably a bit more of maybe a, a, a big, massive dream or goal of mine, I would love to see my images one day potentially in the National Geographic magazine, sure. which, is, which is a pretty out there goal because I think with the with National Geographic and the type of photos that they do share, they're probably not in line with what I currently capture and share. Yeah. But that would be like, that's just, I remember as a kid growing up and mum every month buying the National Geographic magazine and just being fascinated by the images that are in there, whether it's the wildlife or the landscapes and just being like, this is amazing. This is mm-hmm. incredible. And so now that I've got the tools to be able to catch images, I'm like, that would be an amazing goal to have for me. Yeah, cool. In terms of setting some of those goals, do you establish projects to achieve them or are you more spontaneous about, okay, this will help me and I'll just add that to the sh- the shopping cart, or I guess, uh, along the way? Yeah. So I think... In terms of setting things in motion to try and reach those goals, I'm probably very spontaneous in the sense that I would just go and do. I don't necessarily always plan my shoots, whereas mm-hmm. I know some photographers will actually go, okay, I'm going to be at this spot at this time to, to get a certain photo. If, yeah. if I think about trying to get photos in National Geographic and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. In terms of like the travelling and the capturing images of the places that I want to go to, I have like soft plans in place to travel to, to different places. Obviously, New Zealand, that's booked and that's ready to go. And then in terms of the growth, in terms of the images that I want to capture, it's very spontaneous. It's just, it's it, it was actually something that I just do constantly. Like I'm always thinking about. Yeah, right. In that sense. But it's spontaneous in terms of like when I do actually go and do something. I'm shooting most nights and I'm, I'm doing something photography related nearly every day. Mm-hmm. But I don't have set like 30 day, 60 day, 90 day goals. Yeah, right. Or like small things to try and hit those markers. Yep. Okay. But I probably should, it's probably something that would be handy to have to be able to track that progress. Yeah. So I, I guess some people get into the planning side of it a lot more and that becomes integral to not necessarily building their career, but building the elements in their portfolio or building out skill sets that they might want to move into or even trying different genres they say all right how do i apply this to what i've learned here to another genre of photography yeah which is like something that if i think for myself and i realize this you'll chop this out potentially anyway but i've realized i just keep saying i think then i just got myself like tossed anyway back on track the skills that i've learned from landscape I find that I push myself by trying different genres as well. Mm -hmm. So I've recently shot some maternity photos, which are completely different, but it's giving me those extra skills to learn like different styles of shooting Mm. to build on that skill set. which as I get better with different things, I can start incorporating maybe if it's models or people into my landscape photos to give them that extra layer. Yeah. And I think those compositional lessons i don't want to call them rules because yeah you know, yeah okay you got rule of thirds and various other rules in inverted yeah. commas <laughs> but i i think of them more as lessons because you learn as you as, as you form up your compositions you learn what to include what to exclude 
whether or not a tighter crop or a wider shot is going to be right for that particular scene. And I guess applying that into portrait photography, you've got a, or you've already got that sense of what the landscape or what a, a scene might look as a backdrop. And then applying that into portrait photography helps you place your people in the scene in a in an attractive way or in a, in a way that's actually going to make people want to look at it. Yeah. I really like what you said there about like it being a lesson and not necessarily a rule because I find that a lot of people that are, that are coming up in the photography scene, whether they've just picked up a camera or they've been around for a few months, they get really fixated on that as a rule. Hmm. I've got to do this. This is what it's I've got to be do. rule of thirds or it's got to be yeah. whatever. And, and, it, and it doesn't need to be. Yeah. It, it can be whatever it is that you want it to be. They're, they're there to help guide you and the, the, the basics will assist, but you can create whatever it is that you want mm. that aligns with what you want to capture and not necessarily following these set rules in terms of rule of thirds is probably the biggest one that a lot of people do focus on a lot. Yeah, I, th- I think it's about making that creative choice around what's right for the scene. And yeah. to be honest, one of my favourite shots that I've taken personally is one where the, just throw the rule of thirds completely out. That said, there are some elements of using thirds in there, but if it's not traditional. The horizon is really up near the top of the frame and the rest of the scene sort of fills out. But if you look at how things are positioned left and so forth, the negative space versus the bits that it's filled with subject matter, and yes, I've kind of used rule of thirds, but not maybe not in in, in a non traditional way. Yeah, and, and but it's because it's, of it's learning that skill to be able to say, okay, I don't have to put the horizon on the the upper yeah. or the lower third line. It it could be right up near the top or right near the bottom of the frame, depending on what it is that I'm shooting and how I'm actually bringing the whole thing together. Exactly, and and somebody that might be fixated on the rule would be like, no, it's got to be like this. It's got to be like this. And they, they'll they come away with a completely different image. Correct. That, pro- yeah. that could be still a really great image. Oh, absolutely, yeah. But it may not have the same feel that your images has. And they might look at that and go, that's not how I've been taught or how, what the rule says to do. But they'll go, that photo has this certain feeling to it that is that changes, maybe evokes an emotion in them. Mm. And they'll be like, oh, I could, should have tried that. Yeah. yeah. And it's, that's where it's a lesson. You learn as you go. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> See, because I know for me, probably the rule that I follow, not follow, lesson, the lesson I follow the most is like leading lines. Mm. So whether it's the jetty, if it's a path, I hate to say it, but a set of stairs, yep. those leading lines for me are something that I'm all, I think I'm subconsciously drawn to yeah. because I, when I look back, even just thinking about some of my images now, my, 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 my predominantly landscape-based images, there is some form of leading line through an image, whether it's the curve of the beach or it's the stairs or it's a jetty. There's always that probably focus where I'm probably less focused on like the like rule of thirds, for, for instance. Yeah. I think what you're saying about the leading lines, it, it's something which is very common in, in landscape photography. Some might call it cliched, but I don't think cliche, cliched images are necessarily bad either. Yeah. <laughs> because again, as you said, it's really about the emotion that is, is expressed in it and how you react to that and it might be oh i don't want to see any more of those stairs or i don't want to see any more of that jetty or whatever it is because i've seen it so many times there's that that bridge in sweden between sweden and denmark there that i I can't imagine or the opera house or the sydney Harbour bridge that's just been shot to death yeah but there's still certain images that you look at and you go yeah that's a really good one and i it, it really anchors a, an emotion to it and you look at it and go, e- even though compositionally it's probably not very much different to a lot of others, but there's elements in it that make it slightly different enough that you stop, look at it and go, oh, I'm really hooked to that image or to yeah. that composition. Yeah, and you're right. There's I, I saw an image recently of the Sydney Opera House and you see so many of them, especially with like when Vivid's on, Mm-hmm. You know, after the Queen's passing, there was like, there was Opera House. I was just scrolling through Facebook and Instagram and I was just like, Opera House, Opera House, Opera House. 
But then there was one the other day that just like literally stopped me dead. I was just like, wow. And it was not like, it was not, compositionally, it was not unique in any way, but there was just something about the image. I was just like, this is just incredible. Right. And for South Australian based photographers, Port Wollonga, the Port No Longer South Stairs, are probably two of those images, like they're probably South Australia's version of those, yeah. those places in the sense that they're always seen. And people always say to me, they're like, why do you keep going back to the stairs? Why do you keep going back to Port Wollonga? And I'm like, even though compositionally the photos are, are, are relatively similar at times, there's a different feeling and emotion. And yeah, the conditions the, are different and the various yeah. other things that you may do to the image. You might, it might even just be a change in white balance or the temperature, the that that white balance you might just adjust up or down slightly and it changes the feel entirely 100 percent. and one of my images that went viral years and years ago that i absolutely i absolutely hate it like i just hate it and <laughs> i've edited that photo since and it, it it has this totally different feel to it and it's i think that's also the other thing that's beautiful about digital photography is that we can go back and yeah you're not restricted to what you got in the negative then delivering pretty much the same result. Though that said, even in in film in darkroom, if you've got a negative, you can still adjust. Again, depending on if it's color or black and white, even there you can adjust the white balance. You can adjust tone. You can adjust contrast. You can actually make that negative into something completely different to a, a, another processing technique that you put to it, and. Yeah. Yeah, but as you say, it's far easier in, in digital to to get that how you want it. Oh, 100%. Which, yeah. Like, and obviously, it's, just, it's so simple because we can just literally just sit there and go, yep, this photo can be processed hundreds and hundreds of different times and add different elements into it. And, and as you said, just tweak the tiniest of little things and it will change the whole feeling of the image. Yeah. yeah. I guess that leads us on to your approach to photography as it relates to experience versus art. You've obviously attached that emotional response and you're very aware of that. Does that mean that what you're trying to do is artistic with the image or are you still trying to remain true to what you've seen in the and make it more of a, a, I don't want to say documentary per se, because it's not just, here's the shot, here's exactly what it looked like, but the feeling that was there when you were standing maybe at the top of the stairs or the, the bottom of the stairs or where, yeah. wherever you were. Yeah, for me, I've found over the years that's changed. So early on, I was very much about these dreamy, long exposure, ethereal feeling type images that were probably way over the top in terms of saturation and, and vibrancy. And yeah, they, they weren't, yeah, we, we definitely would go through that. And there was, they weren't re, like, they, they were real in the sense, obviously, that the light was there and the colour to some degree was there. Yeah. But I've boosted it and tweaked a lot of it to change it far outside of what it actually was. Mm, mm. And so I'd probably say back then I was probably a bit more of an artist in the sense of I was creating digital art. Yep. As this year has gone along, I feel I've moved more to a lot more natural in terms of removing, even, even though I still capture quite a bit of pastel type images, mm -hmm. they're still true to what they are. Yep. And in some of my images, I'll remove the saturation just so that they don't feel like I have just cracked the saturation or that they're not too vibrant, they're not too punchy, and I'll pull back in certain areas to make it how I felt at the time. Mm -hmm. Whereas two, three years ago, it was the complete opposite. It was like, let's try and make this image just look like out of this world in, in a sense that it was just, it's not real. But people and people would comment and be like, oh, wow. That's amazing. I wish I was there. And I look back now and I go, well, it wasn't actually like that. Yeah, it wasn't wasn't quite the same. Yeah. <laughs> no. And there's certain elements to my images now where probably I'm borderline between pushing it back to how I used to be. Mm. But a lot of my images now I, I feel are definitely more true to how the scene is in terms of the light and the colors. And I'm not playing so much in 
the shadows and, and the split toning and adding extra colors into this to the shadows which is what i used to do a lot so i add a lot of like pinks into the shadows yep uh, and and or sorry into the highlights and then blues into the shadows and just tweak it too much yeah, whereas yeah. now i'm doing less of that but then probably making the glow of the sun just that little bit more now it's probably one of the things yeah. i do a lot mm. In terms of making a conscious decision around that, is that something that you've just changed over time or is it something that you said, okay, well, I'm, I, I guess what drove that decision to change the style slightly? I, I think just as I've grown as an artist mm. or as a photographer, I've gone through, as you mentioned, we all go through that phase where we do super saturated super vibrant images and I, I, like i could easily have stuck to that and just kept doing that just keep punching that up. then i've just as i've grown and, and i've been shooting more and more i've just been more drawn to those a bit more natural images and so it's just it's slowly evolved as time's gone on and it will continue to evolve and and i don't know where i'll be in six months time i may dive back the other way or i may move more into maybe adding extra elements into images like in terms of like maybe just photoshopping things in i, I don't think i will yeah uh, I, I have toyed with it in the past in terms of moving things around in a scene or making the moon bigger than what it actually is but then i don't feel like that's photography and so yeah i, I think of myself as a photographer well, first yeah. yeah yeah it's that's definitely more i'm even though that it's some level of photography, it's not what I want to portray. I want to portray yeah. what the scene is, what the emotion is that I felt when I was there and hopefully invoke that same emotion in somebody that's looking at that image. Yeah, cool. For me, there's no right or wrong here because a composite image, if you've gone out, as long as you're not cutting and pasting other people's work into your images, which as long as you got their permission, that's great if that's yeah. what you do. <laughs> But I, I guess in, in terms of that whole genre of digital art as opposed to straight photography, I guess it, it's really a stylistic choice that people can make. And I certainly, I'm, from my perspective, I do a bit of both and yep. quite happy doing a bit of both, quite nailing a documentary style image that just shows this is what happened or this is what it looked like and just got the colour and contrast exactly right and so forth, but also quite happy to sit there and make a, a nice dreamy shot, as you say, maybe enlarge the moon a little or whatever. The thing is, as long as you're honest about it and as long as you're telling people that's what you're doing, I don't, I, I don't think there's a problem with it. No, and I think that is probably the big thing is because there are photographers that are out there that will create these images and that's it. Yeah. And so people go, oh, wow, that's amazing. I wish I could have gotten that. But really, yeah. there is that composite. And you're right. I think you do need to tell people that, hey, this is actually a composite. Like, I've done this. You don't have to say necessarily, like, this is exactly what I've done and how I've done it, but just be like, this is a composite. This, I didn't add this element. Or I'm... And, and I think that's a very important thing because then it's just setting the right expectation, not expectation, but just showing people that like it's okay to do that as, as well because I, I feel yeah. at times some people are like no you can't do this composite stuff you've got to well, it's like the compositional rules there there, yeah. there there are none really you can pretty much do what you like <laughs> that's yeah. the nice thing about it <laughs> exactly i was talking to someone before this and they're when they are it's a bit cloudy for the moon tonight and so they're hoping to still get a shot and then they'll just composite it into another photo but they've, they've said this is my plan and then i'll share it and explain this is what it is because of the conditions yep. weren't right and i think that's definitely the right way about going about it and, and there's no I, I don't feel it's wrong to do composites no. I, I think similar to yourself i'm probably the same whereas sometimes i'll do it if i think back to an image i think i shared it but then i deleted it because i wasn't 100 happy with it but it was the elements were all from the one night mm -hmm. Uh, and I shot like a skyline of like the Gold Coast skyline. Yep. But where the skyline was, no clouds. Yeah. And so I 
took pan to the right and the colors and the clouds looked amazing. And so I like, took a few photos and then in Photoshop, I just like layered them together and you couldn't tell. Yeah. And, but I didn't end up liking it in the end. So I removed it. Cause I, I think I've, I went through that phase where I was just like, Oh, I don't know if I should be sharing composites. I don't know. Maybe yeah. I should just share what the scene was like on the night. So I removed it, but probably should go back and revisit it and play around with it a bit and then reshare it. Yeah, for me, it's one of the reasons why I've taken to describing not, yes, the settings are there and that's largely the settings. And I'll say this, if I've done an exposure blend, which I do a lot of, because a lot of what I do is high contrast environments, sunrise, sunset, waterfalls, sometimes you get that high contrast and it's really difficult to manage that high dynamic range of very dark shadows and very bright highlights without doing some kind of exposure blending. Yeah. It's not impossible. You get the right camera, you can do it. But I also enjoy the the processing side of things. That to me is is a big part of what I do. And so I'm very open about, yes, this isn't one single image and you couldn't possibly get that necessarily. You could... If you had the right filters and you could make sure that you had a nice flat horizon, which I don't always have and so yeah. forth. But it's really around being honest around what I'm doing. You know? So if I put, put up a composite image, I'm saying this is a composite. Yeah. I'm not saying this is all shot, one shot and hallelujah, I'm an amazing photographer. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but see, I, when I think about what you've just spoken about, I think about that image that you shared was it yesterday with the light through the trees yes that was a single image yeah okay that yeah. i've just when you were talking i thought maybe that was a like a, a blending that like yeah, that image no, that, i think uh, that one i so i did I, I took a range of shots in that one that i i shared there at the Girakul, and the conditions were literally like that there was these beautiful sunbeams come down between the trees lighting up and if you have a look at it it was actually the if you had a look at the raw file, it's probably overexposed by about a stop and a half. And so I brought it down in Adobe Camera Raw by about a, a stop and a half to try and manage the highlights. There's still a couple of blown highlights in small patches, but I'm okay with that. Yeah. But everything else, all I did then was I selectively played with the white balance on the light rays as opposed to the streams of the waterfall. So oh, the, wow. there was more yellow tone in those light streams and more white tone or blue tone in the waterfall stream. And literally yeah. that was the the developing or the processing trick that I used was just selective editing. So you use a, a mask to mask out, that's what I want to... Uh, that's what I want to affect. And I just tweaked the, the white balance for each of those two elements separately. But everything else was pretty much as, oh, as wow. shot. And then it that's... was just around getting contrast and everything right. Yeah, that's incredible. Just to think of like, that. I've never thought about actually doing that, playing around with the different, like, those different values separately. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> this comes from watching copious amounts of YouTube. And uh, yeah. I keep telling a lot of people that F64 Academy, Blake Brutus, his understanding of how Photoshop works is, I, I think, almost second to none. And his way of describing how to manage colour in particular and selectively manage colour, he's got some fantastic tutorials on how to do some of those things. And it's really that, that and the ability to, I guess, now in... Adobe Camera Raw, if I'd done that in Photoshop, I don't use Lightroom personally. Yep. I actually find the, uh, what do you call it, the database that it builds, the galleries and everything annoying. I find it easier to find stuff in the file system just using Windows Explorer <laughs> personally. Yeah. <laughs> but any, anyway, I use the ability to use masks in Adobe Camera Raw slash Lightroom is really the thing that triggered that thinking process and the I guess the thought behind getting around to actually editing an image that way it's not a technique I've used a lot 
recently yeah. in terms of the white balance separation. I've done quite a lot of a lot of my images. I do selective contrast adjustments. So you'll select mid tones, highlights, and shadows. And then selectively using a curves adjustment, tweak each of the the contrast elements in those those three differently. So you're separating separating out how the contrast actually works across the image. So that that's a technique I've used quite a bit. And the reason I do that is because it just gives you really fine tuned control over every part of your image and how it how the contrast actually works within that image. Which is something that you don't really get in Lightroom. We don't get in Lightroom. You don't get that fine level of control. Unless you're using luminosity masks, yeah. It's, yeah. it's almost... Uh, you, you can do it with masking now to a point. Yeah. So I think that the most recent update in, in Lightroom, there was the ability to use curves adjustment with a mask. Oh, Okay. So if you take a look at it, I don't know if you've got the, the, the latest Lightroom, but if you take a look at the latest Lightroom and get into masks, you'll now see that there's the little uh, contrast adjustment, um, which means that you can either brush or you can select, select through luminosity or colour or whatever, select your mask as long as you know how to select your mask. Yeah. You can actually affect individual parts of your image now which uh, something i've been doing for years now in uh, in photoshop because photoshop gives you that with luminosity mask the ability to actually mask based on the luminosity of each of the pixels which means you can make very fine-tuned adjustments to it all Anyway, enough of the technology. No, that's, see, that stuff interests me. I know probably people listening are probably like, oh, geez, these guys, they're talking about things we can't see. They've spoken about an image that we can't that's actually it. Yeah, see. I'm, I'm here waving my arms around. Yeah, yeah. I'll just yeah, hold up little signs. But uh, like, it's really interesting to, to talk about that sort of stuff because it's something that, you know, when it comes to the post-processing, we all probably spend different amounts of time mm. like processing an image. Some people might just pop an image straight into Lightroom or, and whack a preset on it and then go, boom, see you later, I'm off. Yeah. And some people photo will use Photoshop and spend a lot of time playing with little parts of an image to perfect an image. And I, and I find that really interesting because it's you and I could go to the same scene and take the same image. Or and like they process image. it completely differently, yeah. yeah. I, I and, can give you one of my raw files and it will, or a group, a, a bracketed group that I would use for a, an exposure blend and you would come up with a, a completely different look to, yeah. to, to what I did. <laughs> And use different tools and different ways of doing it. But I'm going to have to play around with that, with those new tools in Lightroom because I don't generally Yeah, play the, ma- around. the masking tool in Lightroom just opens up massive possibilities that weren't there 12 months ago. For me, as I say, it's it, everything in, in Lightroom is there in Adobe Camera Raw. Because I don't want the baggage that comes with the database that... Lightroom sets up and the gallery, to be honest, the gallery does my head in Yeah, (laughs) for two reasons. One, it's actually creating a database which takes up disk space and when you load it into memory as well, yeah, you can play around with caching and everything and you can optimise it, but it's still taking up system processing resources that I prefer to you because I use Photoshop and Photoshop's a hungry beast as as it is. And I know Lightroom can be a hungry beast as it is, but I've just found working my process, doing away with the database, doing away with, therefore with Lightroom, working within Adobe Camera Raw, which basically has almost all of the developing, that, that developer tab or the develop tab in Lightroom is exactly what Adobe Camera Raw provides. And so as long as you've got the raw image, you can pretty much do whatever you like to it. And to a, to a point, you can do a bit with a JPEG image. Yeah. Because when I first started with photography, it was Photoshop that I used. And so I, I was really probably saying the sort of thing like the Adobe Camera Raw and then like take it into Photoshop and play around with different layers and mask to some degree. I'm still doing that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then I, I think maybe, I don't want to say laziness, 
but out of I found Lightroom then easy. I played around with Lightroom. I was like, oh, this is a lot easier, like little sliders. But for me, it just like I I personally like the file structure. Yeah, of and Lightroom. I'm not saying it's it's yeah. just a, a personal thing. I I don't like what it does to the computer in terms of yeah. slowing it down and taking up this space and. So I ditched it a few years ago. It's probably improved out of sight from where it was, but yeah, it's just uh, something that I I don't like and don't want. The the last week I've had continuous issues with my catalogs being corrupted. So I've been like deleting catalogs, backing up, like using backups, and then reinstalling yep. thousands <laughs> of photos that I've taken because it just yep it doesn't work. And then earlier in the year I lost every single photo that I took in February because yeah. my catalog crashed and I don't know what happened. And then everything was gone. And cause I was traveling across Queensland, New South Wales with a mate, my, my backup hard drive is, was, is here. And I was like, I've literally just lost everything I took in February. So the one thing I do miss out on, which I would like, but I've got, because I work non-destructively in Photoshop anyway. So I create quite a few layers, but the one thing that I would like is all of the stuff that you do in Lightroom, you can, and again, this is another thing that adds weight to the database and everything because it stores this with your image file, is all of the edits that you've made, all of the changes that you've made. So all of the snapshots that you've held on to and selected, but every edit you've made is actually reversible in Lightroom and that's great I, I love that fact but you can actually do the same sort of thing in Photoshop it just takes a little bit more faffing about and uh, but anyway <laughs> I guess talking less about the technology actually why don't, why don't we talk a little bit about that because you raise something that I ask quite a bit on the show is the relationship between where you shoot, what you shoot, how you shoot, and how you process, and which one is the biggest driver for you? Is it do you shoot a certain way, and do you shoot certain subjects because they're close, handy, and you process a certain way, or do you shoot certain subjects because you love them and then that drives how you process and how you shoot them? Yeah. So I'm driven by location. Mm. 100% it's everything is a location and it's not because they're close. So for me, I shoot a lot south of Adelaide CBD. Yep. And it's actually, depending on traffic, an hour to an hour and a half drive every time for me, depending on the area. Yep. And... But it's just the areas that I go to or the areas that are south are just so photogenic and that's what drives me to shoot those locations. And then in terms of the the post-processing side, that's changed again. So for me, I used to shoot a lot of like long exposures. Everything was let's chuck a 10-stop ND filter in front of it mm-hmm. and smooth out the motion. Let's capture some the clouds dragging through an image. Yep. And... I was driven by that because it created this real ethereal feel with the, mm. the cloudy milkiness of the water because that's like I found that people that I worked with or people that were commenting on my stuff were like, wow, this is amazing. It looks like it's a cloud scene like with the water, like it's this misty fog. Like, well, that's just amazing because they've never seen that. Yeah, because you seen can't see it with the human eye. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, and then like the clouds, it's, just, it's like a painting and now – like the majority of my stuff now is less with filters and I'm capturing whether it's, I still capture a little bit of motion if, if there's water in my scene, but generally I prefer the look of like half a second exposure. Yeah. Just that little bit of a drag of, of a wave or the, yeah. or the flow of the water as it goes out. So everything for me is driven by the locations and then I shoot depending on the conditions that are there. Yeah. Right. So if it's a bit more of an overcast day and then sunset's going to be a bit more miserable, then I'll generally aim for those longer exposures because I feel that you capture a bit of the mood mm-hmm. of the scene if it's a bit darker. If there's a lot of bright light and the sun's like blaring, then I'll generally aim for like shorter exposures and try and 
yeah, frame right. my scene in a way that the sun is just out of the frame and then so that glow comes into the scene mm -hmm. and then I'll make that pop a little bit more when it comes to the post-processing, whether it's being using like a radial filter with a really soft like edge to it and just really blow it out and just tweak the exposure just this, like, just the tiniest little bit. Sure, sure. And add a bit of more orange to it and I just find that for me, I just love that kind of feeling of an image. Yeah, nice. How about yourself? Think, I'm curious to know. Is it similar for yourself in terms of? Yes. I, I shoot, as I said, as I described before, I shoot the way that I do largely because I'm well aware of the limitations that I have on the gear. It's got reasonable dynamic range in camera, but it's still not as good as a human eye. And therefore, to get something that looks a bit like what you can see with the human eye, that's it. And, and I'm excluding the very long exposure stuff that I might do at half an hour before or an hour sometimes before sunrise, that nautical twilight where you've literally got to have the, the shutter open for seven minutes, excluding those because they're out there shots. <laughs> a, not many people do them and B, yeah. They have their own look and feel and they're a bit of a lottery when you make them as well because you're not guaranteed to get quite the effect that you expected. But in terms of if I was going to the beach and doing a, a sunrise shoot, that kind of dictates to me that I've got to do some kind of bracketing and therefore some kind of exposure blending because if I don't, to me, yes, I could buy filters. And this is one of the other things. Part of it's an economic reason. I don't see, personally, a lot of value in buying grad filters, whether they're hard or soft grad. And I don't own any. And I probably don't ever see myself buying any simply because I can do what I want to do without those filters. And... I can get a scene that looks, because I'm taking an exposure that's exposed for the brightest highlights and exposures that are for the darkest shadows and a few in between, depending on how how many stops that looks like, whether it's a four or a five stop change, I'll do somewhere between three and five exposures. In some cases, I'll find, okay, because I haven't quite calculated it right, I only need to use two. Yeah. That that sort of high dynamic range shot dictates, because I don't own any grad filters and probably never will, it, it dictates that I've got a bracket and therefore that dictates how I shoot. If I go waterfall hunting, that's slightly different, but again, you can still get some with with the caves that get in behind the, the waterfall and the bright white of the water falling itself, you, you again can get into some high dynamic range situations. But when it's a dull day and you've got even light and everything, then I don't shoot that. <laughs> so yeah. again, as you said, it depends on the conditions. It depends on what it is that you're taking a shot of and sometimes how I feel at the time. Could I be bothered messing around with it? That said, that... I fully, I go into it fully understanding if I'm going to do a five shot bracket and the attendant processing that comes behind that, the post processing takes a bit of time. And, but it's something that I enjoy doing equally as much as I enjoy shooting. Yeah. I know a lot of people, they're loath to spend 10 minutes on their processing. But I look at that a bit like, the time that you spend in the dark room back in the day when you were doing film is the time where you're actually bringing the image into the world and into a form of finishing that, that image so that it's ready for public consumption or personal consumption if you don't show your images to anyone. So for me, it, it's really about that they're, they're two sides of the same coin and the shooting and the processing go hand in hand. Sometimes, as I say, though, I'll surprise myself and I'll find something and I'll take another look at it like I did with the one that I, I posted the other day with the waterfalls that we were talking about just before. 
and be able to go, okay, well, when I first looked at that image, I thought, yeah, it's overexposed. I won't bother too much with it. And I moved on to other frames in the in, in the shoot because I thought they gave me better value for time at the time. But when I've got the time, I'll go back into the archive and I'll take a look, take a second look and go, okay, let's reconsider this one. Let's see what I can do with it, chuck it in, play with it. Can I get something that actually looks any good? And sometimes you get one that does. <laughs> yeah. I think there's coming back with fresh eyes. Oh, absolutely. It's also so important because you can come back after a shoot, look at a few images and go, yeah, I'm not feeling this stuff. But then yeah. a week later, two weeks later, three weeks later, you come back and you go, oh, hold on, there's actually something here. That's exactly right. Yeah. Spend that time and then turn that into something that you go, wow, how did I not see this originally? Potentially. Yeah. And the number of things, I, I look at it, look at them as saying, all right, there's primary images. I've, I've nailed the composition. I've nailed what I want to do with it. And I've been able to process it and come out with something that I think is a, a really good shot. And I have the secondaries, which might sit in my archive for years before I touch them. Yeah. And some of those secondary ones are actually some of my favourites now because you go back to them, as you say, with fresh eyes and you go, wow, this, uh, I don't know why I didn't look at this one sooner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but when there's so many photos, well, you know, well depending, that's it. On, yeah. depending on how often you go out, you're talking about hundreds or thousands of photos. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you- well, particularly when you're uh, doing exposure blending, because I'm typically taking, I, I'll, I, I will set up and I will do five images, say at f8, then I might flick up to f11 or f13 or f14 and flick a, another five of the same composition, and then the light will change, and then I'll change settings yeah. again without moving and flick off another five. I could be getting 20 or 30 images of the same composition within a fairly short period of time, within three or four minutes of, of setting up that composition. So it, it's it, for, for me, it's about making sure that there's a, a, a path that you can get what you want and you, yourself. It can be, okay, I want a bit of streaky cloud in in this set, so I've got to do long ex- longer exposures or... I don't want that and therefore I'm going to do shorter exposures and it, it's that trial and error and experimentation that means you do take a lot more shots than oh, you yeah, may, may end up using. <laughs> and I think similar to like yourself, I will do, I don't bracket as much anymore. When I first started, I used to bracket a lot and I'd probably do three or five, sometimes seven, which I found was just overkill. Yeah, seven, seven's overkill. I've, I've never found a need to go that high. No, uh, I I did it for a while because I think I watched a video that said, oh, do seven. You'll get way more. No, it's too much time. <laughs> and now I don't, I think since I got the D850, when I first moved to that, the dynamic range of that camera was just so much that I was shooting bracketing to start off with. And I was like, I don't need this. Yeah, you don't. Yeah. Yeah. And then when I moved to the Z line of cameras, it's the same thing. The dynamic range within those was just so much. So I was like, I don't need this. But that being said, I still shoot multiple frames because I'll I might start shooting shorter exposures so I'm capturing the texture of a wave or the texture of the water and then slowly yeah. I'll you know, I might pop a filter on or I might tweak some settings and just drag that shutter a little bit and then I'll go okay let's go full long exposure and so I'll come away with the same composition for the most part but I'll have five different images because there's something different or the one that always comes to mind is those stairs and I'll have if someone's come walking up the stairs as they've come back from the swim, then I get the wet footprints in the stairs. Yep. So then I'll play around with that until the, the feet slowly dry away. Yeah. So it's really interesting that I can yeah. still do the same thing. So, and I find particularly with uh, waves when you're doing those somewhere between a quarter and a half a second, the textures that you get are, are, are very different. But you can also not always predict as the tide rises or falls, you can't always predict how that's going to play over the rocks that you or or on the sand that you're shooting and therefore you're not always going to get consistent results because each wave is going to be different not not every wave flows in exactly the same way and you might find a two or three in a set that might flow in a similar way but then you might find the water 
fills up because the you're getting to the last wave in the set because they they come in sets of five to seven and so that last couple of waves is going to flow completely different to the first one where the waves or the set before it had time to drag out and there was less water in in that sort of foreground 100 and i think for me with especially with the water it's now that the weather is getting warmer like i'll start jumping back into the water with my water housing and mm. i'm like, i've been addicted to capturing the light on top of the water and every image is different and even though like the water is just, just for the yeah. most part if it's if it's a calm day it's, it's like this but the way that the light dances across the water as you're taking images i'll come away with if I'm trigger happy, I'll come away with a couple of hundred, hundred images mm. and I'll be s- skimming through them in Lightroom. And I'll just be like, wow, look at the way the light bounced off the water there. And then it's like this. Or then there might be a bit, little bit of water drops on the water housing. And so then it's, you get a bit of, it's incredible. It's just so different, even though it's the same. And then I'll play around with even dragging the shutter a bit. So I'm a bit slower. And then it's different again in terms of the texture of the water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the most memorable experience you've had out shooting? Uh, I have to go for the first thing that came to my mind, and that would be, and it's not, it's not a landscape photo, mm. but it's diving with turtles earlier oh, this year. Hey. Uh, that was just that's been something that's on a on bucket list shot for me to go doing that, and I just remember like jumping into the water, diving around, and then just all of a sudden in front of me was just this big massive turtle and I was just like you could I was squealing through the snorkel <laughs> and when I came up because my mate was still on the boat I was like Jay you got to get in here and he like jumped in and by the time he got there the turtle swam off and we ended up finding it again but afterwards he's like they were worried you were drowning like, what do you mean <laughs> and he goes because you were squealing through the snorkel and they thought maybe something had happened or something had gotten you or you'd cramped or something and they were actually thinking about coming to rescue. And he's, he, I told them that you were just a kid in a candy store <laughs> that had seen a turtle. And so that probably, like, if I think about most memorable moments, that would be, that would probably be the one that comes to mind, which is not, it's not a landscape. Oh, it's, it's, it's a great memory though. Yeah. It's, it, and like one of my favorite photos I've taken is it's one of those photos from that series with the turtle and just the blue of the water and yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm hoping to get back to Julian Rocks next next year and dive. Hopefully, hopefully there's no floods or anything like that. Because when we went, the it was probably about a week or two after some of the floods, yeah. and so the water was quite murky. Yeah. So the images probably weren't as crystal clear as they could have been. So I'm really keen to to get back to there, and I think from a landscape perspective, there's probably too many to count. Like in terms of moments, I, I, I think the, the first moment that actually comes to mind is, and it bounces back to what we were talking about in terms of dynamic range, it was I'd bought the D850 and the the first place I took the, the camera to was the, the stairs that are synonymous with my name in Adelaide. And I was so excited because the, the sun dipped below the horizon and it was a dull, very dull sunset. And I was like, oh. I was like, damn, my first outing with this camera and it's, it's a dud sunset. And I was just sitting there watching it and then all of a sudden just it just started to glow. Yeah. And it was just glowing. And I was like, I got all excited that when I had finished taking all my photos and I'd gotten home that night, I was like, yes, yes, I've got like magic. I've got magic. I know I have. But I looked at the photos again and I'd underexposed the images by like probably three stops. Oh, wow. Maybe like the images, apart from the horizon that was just glowing, yeah. everything else was like almost black. And I was like, I just was like. And if you bring the shadows up, you've just got noise. Yeah. No, the photo is perfect. Oh, okay. I'll have to send it to you after this. I know like for people that are listening, yeah, like, visually it's not going to help them, but it, it would, like I was just, I was blown away because the, the camera just captured so much dynamic range. It was able to bring. Wow. it all out and there was not a great deal of noise i think for posting online for facebook and instagram anyway it was fine but I'll, yeah. yeah i'll send i'll go find it and i'll send it back to, I'll, I'll send you both and uh, and you'll see that was probably probably one of the, my most memorable landscape moments but just because it's me just being excited 
because yeah. I get very excited when the light and and you're know, going back to what we were talking about earlier is my thing is chasing the light. Yeah. And so yeah. when the light is incredible, what's really good, I get goosebumps and I get excited and I, I lose the, my thought process. Mm-hmm. And so photography, I find, and I don't know about yourself and like how long have you been shooting for? I can't remember. Okay. <laughs> So I, because people always say, that, like, how do you capture the images that you're doing or how do you capture moments? And and maybe you're exactly the same, so correct me if I'm wrong, but for me, it's just, it's second thought most of the time. Yeah. I, there's not a lot of thought that goes in. It's just my fingers flick on the dials and then I'm like, bam, here we go. Um, and I think it's just because it's, I've spent. I'm thinking more of the composition and getting yeah. excited by the light that I'm seeing, but I'm thinking more, okay, do I, do I, with the zoom lens do i crop in a little bit do i pull back what do i do there do i tilt left or right or up or down and they're they're the main things but once i've actually settled that's the comp i want yeah i don't i don't think much about the shooting other than yeah yeah going up and down the aperture scale maybe a little bit to give me what i want yeah yeah and i'm exactly the same i'll focus on what how what i want the image to look like in terms of the composition but settings-wise, there's not a lot of thought that happens. But when the light is really nice, I lose that. It's like, okay. like I probably feel, I can't think of another phrase to use, but baby brain, which <laughs> I'm a man, I can't get baby brain. But a, a girl at work's pregnant, she's talking about a baby brain today. And I was like, that's probably what it is. I actually forget what I'm doing. And so yeah. I'll come away with these images and I'll be like, oh, what was I doing? <laughs> and Or I'll see them on the back of the screen afterwards. And I'm like, what was I doing? Like, what was I thinking? And... Like that's where luckily the D850 was was powerful enough in those few instances where, because that wasn't the only time that I got excited and just underexposed images, that I'd luckily be able to bring them back. Mm. But yeah. Nice. I sound, I sound rather silly, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm totally with you. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so that's I'm probably I'm a little bit worried because as I've mentioned a few times, off to New Zealand in 30-something days, and everyone's like, oh, I can't wait to see what you come away with in New Zealand. And well, I'm actually... The expectation scared. bar's been set high. It's high. <laughs> but I'm like, I'm freaking out because I'm like, I know that I'm going to see something and I'm going to be absolutely blown away by the beauty of, of the scene. And I don't know if you've ever been to New Zealand, have you? Or? I have, but only for work and only oh. to the North Island. Okay. I haven't been to the South Island at all, I, I regret to say. Yeah, hopefully there's still time. Now the borders are open and I just know I'm going to see something and I'm just going to be like blown away and I'm going to come away with, sure, I'll know I'll I'll come away with images because I'll calm myself down. But I think the first day or two, I'm just going to be like, oh, wow. But I I, I think, to be honest, this this is one thing that a lot of photographers sometimes forget to do is to actually sit there and enjoy that moment for what it is as opposed to sitting there concentrating on trying to get the mm. setting right and all the rest of that sort of thing. Yeah, great if you can manage both. But some of my favourite moments are ones where I haven't even got the camera out of the bag. Yeah. And it's just sitting there watching the sunrise, sitting next to my wife or watching the sunset. Or even like tonight, just ducking outside and watching yeah. the... duck um, outside and have a look at the moon. I'm, I'm not going to take a camera out there and try and shoot the moon tonight. Yeah. My, my laptop, because of I logged into Instagram to get ready for this, so like it's now sending me notifications every now and again, and literally I've had probably three or four in the last ten minutes, being like, "You better be taking photos of this," and I'm like, "No, I'll, I'll reply later." <laughs> um, I might, I, like I probably will duck outside and take some photos afterwards, but I think yeah. I'll probably just, probably like similar to you, I'll just go out and just enjoy it. It's like I said earlier, it's the moon. It doesn't really fit with what I share, and there's nothing. It's, it's just literally just going to be the moon in the sky. This is it. It's too high for it to be set against anything interesting. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, for me, it's there'll be a lot of other people taking shots of it, so I, I don't need to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I'll, I'll just, I know it'll be all over like Facebook and Instagram yeah. tonight, tomorrow. The news pages will share it all. And like, oh, yeah, cool. That's, that's exactly it. But I don't want to, I want to let you get out and, do what you want to do with the moon but what do you like to do when you're not out shooting i'm, I'm a big on learning so there's two things that are, are very important for me one is the gym so i spend a fair bit of time at the gym 
I may end up going for a second time tonight because I've cut my session earlier. Mm-hmm. So physical fitness and health and fitness is very important to me. Yep. And the second one is learning. I'm very big on continuously learning and not necessarily always photography related. I read books on all different sorts of subjects or I watch YouTube documentaries or documentaries just about random things that yep. just nothing to do with anything photography related. Like before this, before jumping on with you, I was actually watching a YouTube documentary about Papa John's. Oh, yeah. The story of Papa John's in America and how they started, like the guy that founded it and then all the stuff behind how that began and then how it got to where it's at and then the problems that they face and stuff like that. Just random stuff that like it's, I just love to just watch random videos like that and just learn different things that random bits of points in time I may just bring into conversation with people and go, oh, okay, that's all right. But if I'm not shooting, I'm probably also thinking about photography. It's, it, it consumes me in that sense that I'm, it, it's a big part of my life. It's a huge part of my life. That, yeah. oops, I think there. everyone that is a serial, or, and whether you get paid to do it or whether you're full-time or part-time, but people that are serious about it, I, I think I uh, have to have that little bit of OCD-ness about them that yeah. the brain just gets channeled and I've got to do this. I've got to go out at sunrise and I've got to... <laughs> <laughs> got yeah, to go um, and stand in the water and up to my knees or up to my neck or whatever and get the shot <laughs> yeah and it's it's you're right this it is probably a big thing like the, probably the right way of describing it because definitely that's probably if, yeah, yeah it is it really is and one of the things that i've been focusing on a lot over the last probably three months trying to get myself better is because this year i started teaching for nikon mm-hmm. like teaching live classes and when I first started to where I'm at now, like trying to teach people that might have different learning styles to myself, whether they're audio or visual and and trying to make sure that these people that are paying to come to classes and learn how to capture images or improve or feel better with their camera. So I've been watching a lot of content on learning styles and how to teach people different things, which has been a pretty big learning curve. I've still got a lot to learn. Yeah. But I'm enjoying it. I, I, I really do enjoy getting out and just getting hands on with people. And no, that's talking. fantastic. Have you ever hit a creative wall? And if so, how did you handle it? I've definitely had, hit a lot of creative walls over the years. And for me, in terms of handling those early on, I, I got really frustrated with myself and I'd beat myself up that I just didn't really have that desire to go out and create or capture images and I would you know, I'd go for these drives, long drives, whether it's down south or even just to some of the local beaches in Adelaide or a few times I've driven to like the York Peninsula, which is four hours away, and I'd take all the camera gear, but I just wouldn't shoot. And I'd beat myself up because I was like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Why am I still driving now? Why can't I take photos? Why is there no desire to do it? And as I've grown as a person, I've realised that, during those periods of time where I've hit that creative wall, it's just to accept it yeah, yeah. and and not beat myself up and, and then pivot into something else, find something else to do. Or like you mentioned before, still go out, but don't take the camera yeah. and just go and appreciate the moment yeah. that they are and just sit there, read, meditate, just not be too concerned. Whereas like probably four years ago, three years ago, I would really beat myself up. I'd feel down. So then I'd feel worse yep. and I'd fall deeper and deeper into that rut and, and getting out just took a, a long time. I'm curious to know about yourself though. Like how about, what do you do or if you found yourself in them? Oh, I started a podcast. So yeah. <laughs> that's one way that I dealt with a creative wall, but that was more a, a wall that was imposed on me because that was middle of COVID lockdowns 165 days where I wasn't allowed more than 5Ks away from the front door. But other creative walls, yeah, I tend to do similar sorts of things in terms of just going out and enjoying an experience, but I'll, I'll just go and do something else for a little while if I get feel that I'm in a bit of a rut or things aren't working the way that I, I want them to. Um, and sometimes that may be completely and utterly divorced from anything to do with photography. 
sometimes I'll also, you know, do something different with photography. So just pick up the camera and do something in a different genre or play around with it in a different way and do something a bit more experimental that I may or may never share with anyone else other than people that I think might appreciate it. You know, it depends yeah. on how, how I feel about it at the end. You know? <laughs> but, yeah, it's not something that I... Uh, i, I got to say it hasn't happened a lot, but it, it's something that I'm very conscious of looking at strategies for avoiding it in the first place. And one of the things that I've done in terms of that for my own mental well-being is actually getting a lot more relaxed about what happens on social media and getting a lot more relaxed about whether or not there are or aren't likes or whatever. Those things can consume you a little bit and they can therefore impact what you're doing with your photography. And if I don't have a post every night, I don't care. I, I, I will when I can and I won't when I don't. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's really important. And yeah, especially because the, the whole social media side of it is is great because you want to share these images that you you love. Mm. And then you so you go and you post them and then you're like, yes, it's going to be amazing. And then you come back and it's like, hold on, two people like this or whatever it is. And whether it's the algorithm or people just don't jive with what you've put up, it shouldn't matter. And people put too much stock in it. I think, and it's really just about, I, if I think about it and think about the people that do comment and I see regularly, they're the ones that are obviously, I, I don't want to say fans because I don't think I've necessarily got fans. Maybe there might be some fans coming off the, the back of the podcast now, but <laughs> you know, to be honest, it's not something that I, I think, too much about but I do appreciate those that are there and yeah. if you do comment I'll always comment back as much yeah. as I possibly can and, and it's really important because a lot of people get so stuck in that whole like they'll get upset they'll I, I've known friends in Adelaide that have almost deleted their accounts because yeah. they get depressed because they're not getting the engagement that they get and Instagram removing the likes for a period of time was really good because that kind of helped. They then obviously allowed it to come back and, and so you can see some people's likes and other times or you can hide them if you want. But I think it's more about just sharing what you like. And one of the questions I get a lot when people reach out to me and stuff is, how do I get more likes? How do I get more followers? Yeah. And my response is always the same. It's don't worry about the number of likes. Don't worry about the followers. Like, why yeah, do you want what you enjoy sharing? Yeah. What like why do you want this? And they'll be like, because I want to work with brands or I want to be like famous. I want to be Instagram. an influencer. Yeah. Yeah, I want to be an influencer. <laughs> like, but it's not important. It doesn't no. matter. Like it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. Like that's exactly it. Yeah. I know people that have under a thousand followers, but they get offered to shoot like cars for Peugeot and Ford and all these brands. Yep. And I know people that have 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, they get nothing. Yeah. And it's because the brands, they see the content. Like they, your content may not always reach the right person, but if it reaches the right person and they look at your style and they go, wow. I want to work with you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to work with you. They're going to go, oh, wow. They don't, they're not going to go, oh, you've only got 500 followers. Like you're not good enough. Because it's the content is what's important and sharing yeah. what you love, what you like. And then that will come across that people will feel that in your images. And then the rest might come. It may not come, but that shouldn't get you upset. Yeah. Or get you down. And it shouldn't, and it shouldn't dictate your life. And social media, if it's a big part of your life, I get it. If you were let's say you were somebody with you know 40 50 thousand followers and it was your business and you are an influencer for whatever brands or whatever the hell, then great i can understand why you might be really looking hard at your engagement but if you're just a hobby 
or amateur or even a professional photographer that is just enjoying sharing your work, just do it and don't worry too much about the rest of it. Oh, that's it. And I, I'm guilty of it myself. Like when probably before, probably mid last year, before that, my account was off the hook. I was getting thousands of likes on images. I was getting yep. hundreds of comments. And I was like, wow, like my account was growing massively. And the last year and a half, it's like just dropped off. Sometimes I might post and I might get 200 likes. Yep. I, I look at it because I'm just curious, but I don't get upset anymore. Yeah. Whereas a year ago or two, like, yeah, a year ago or even before that when it was good, but then I'd post something and it wouldn't go great, I would probably fall back into that rut a little bit and I'd be like, well, what's the point? Yeah. Whereas yeah. now I'm like, cool, whatever. Like it doesn't matter. It's I'm sharing content that I love. And, and sometimes people, I post. The people that like you will seek you out and find you and like your stuff the ones uh, a big part of it particularly with instagram at the moment is the way that they uh feeding you everyone that you don't follow (laughs) that that's certainly not helped anyone as far as i'm concerned but there are ways of actually seeing a feed which is your followers and people that you follow and that's the way that I engage with it now and I, I rarely use the, the standard feed. I'll tell, tell you another little secret and they'll, they'll probably shut it down after they hear this. Not that I think they're listening. But if you look at the desktop version of Instagram as opposed to the app, you get a feed of your followers. Oh. And you get a lot less ads. I won't say you get none. Yeah. You get a lot. I, I certainly noticed that I, I get half the ads, half the sponsored posts that I do on, and I can literally sit there and scroll, open both at exactly the same time, and the, the post feeds are completely different. Yeah, because I don't know if you've noticed that. I've only noticed this probably the last two days. That if I click on someone's profile mm. and I start scrolling, instead of looking at their feed as a grid, if I go through their posts and scroll through their post. Yeah. I now get sponsored posts. That's it. And I'm like, hold on, I've clicked on. And so I go, do I not click on their profile? Because I'm like, who's this name? And I'm like, hold on, sponsored. I'm like, go back. I'm "I'm on their profile. Why is Instagram showing me a sponsored post when I'm on someone's, I'm trying to scroll through someone's profile? I'm like, that's really cheeky. But But you don't see, interestingly, you don't see that in the desktop version. Yeah. Okay. At least. As of when this was recorded. Yeah. They, do you know, I know you said like they're not listening, but they're always listening. Yeah. I've got my phone here in front of me. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mine's said, too. They're like, the AI bot is taking notes. <laughs> yeah. Hold on. Let me just refresh the uh, Instagram web page. That's right. <laughs> uh, are there any photographers out there that you think I should be talking to? Uh, I'm just trying to think of who you haven't had. I, I think one, Josh Beams. I haven't Once spoken you've... to Josh. I'm I'm aware of his work, yes. Yeah, Josh is a really incredible photographer. I remember a few years ago watching him. Uh, he came to Adelaide with Nikon and I went to his, like I sat in with his thing and I was just blown away at just the way that he talks and his thought process behind the images. Yep. So Josh is really incredible. If I think about some South Australian photographers, there's a photographer called Troy Story. Okay. Uh, I'll send you his profile afterwards. Yeah, he but... is, so he's, he, oh, he's not a landscape photographer, but if you're, he does do some landscape, but he has a totally different way of seeing the world and his landscape photos that he does take are just out of this world. You've done Marissa. Yep. I love Marissa stuff. Have you done, I think it's Bridie Lou, Bridget? No. She's a Gold Coast based photographer. She's really no. incredible with her sunrises and. I know Bridget. Yep. I know I'm just naming off Nikon photographers here as well. So <laughs> I know we usually cop a bit of slack in the community because everyone says that our cameras are like potatoes, but I don't know. <laughs> what brand do you shoot with? Me? I'm a Canon. Um, okay. it, it's basically, in, interestingly, I had a Nikon point and shoot and at some time a couple of Canon point and shoots and this was back in the day when they first came out and I hadn't got a, I was still using a film SLR. I hadn't bought a DSLR at the time. And 
I just found the colour on the Canons looked a lot better than it did on the Nikon that I had. Yeah. And it might have just been that particular model or that particular sensor or whatever, I don't know. But then when I did a little bit of playing around and shopping around and I found, I won't say the same, but similar sort of colour differences, that the colour in the, the Nikons weren't quite as vibrant as they were, the blues weren't quite as vibrant as they were in, in the Canon. And, yeah, so that, that was why I picked them back yeah, in the yeah. day, years, years and years ago, 2000 and, uh two or three or whenever it was i think <laughs> just a little while ago now a little while ago now it's, it's hard to believe that's 20 years ago yeah but it's, it's interesting that you mentioned about the color because i and i guess maybe that's why i've stuck to nikon over the years is i love their colors yeah it's a preference i know yeah, yeah. and it's, it's like when people when you, I, I know what i've told people like, oh like what do you love about nikon cameras i'm like the colors of the images that it comes out they're looking aren't they all the same it's like, no they're not uh, they're not because even not. sony have a feel sony I think a lot is, yeah so i've got to say i'm not a fan of sony's color it's to me it's just not not as good as either nikon or or canon or fuji yeah but to be honest i'm not really a gear snob i don't I, I would shoot anything if I had it, but yeah. now I've got a whole bunch of Canon glass. I can't see myself changing. I'm coming up for that choice around mirrorless and what I jump to there. Do I ditch all the glass? But then I also think economically for 200 bucks, I can also attach all of the nice L glass that I've got from Canon to the mirrorless. So I'll probably do that. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I don't know enough about I'm not a, I'm probably similar to myself. I'm not a gear stub. I'll shoot with anything. I can't work a Canon camera at all. Like someone gives me a Canon, I'm like, oh, what am I doing? I'm, the same. Uh, I'm a bit the same with Nikon and Sony. Sony, I think, has got a much worse interface than either Nikon. Nikon's see, a little bit more intuitive. Yeah. See, I'm better with Sony, but that's only because my best mate has like a Sony. So yeah, when right. we go out and shoot, like I might shoot him with his camera. But the adapted lenses, I, I found when I've, I've got one old Nikon lens now or Sigma lens actually and adapted it works perfectly so I imagine Canon would be the same that like adapted yeah, would be. a mate of mine he's just shifted to he does a lot of motorsport photography he's just shifted to the R3 and I think he also has an R5 which are like your, your two top of the range the R3 is really aimed at sport shit. yes you could shoot anything you want with it but when you're talking about the ability to do something like, what is it, 60 or 70 frames a second on electronic shutter, it's really all about being able to do sports photography more than anything. And the R5 is more, more attuned to a, a general workhorse across the board. It'll pretty much do anything except it won't perform quite as well as the r3 but he's done the same in terms of the adapter he's he bought the 200 hundred dollar adapter and his old glass works just as well as yeah. the new glass some of the new glass has a couple of extra features because you've got because you've got in body and in lens stabilization in the r series they work together to give you a, a much better image so with the older lenses, even though they might have image stabilization on the on the camera, it's it just doesn't work quite as well. As, uh, this is his, yeah, yeah, uh, sort of opinion to to as he's related it to me. But yeah, I've got one more question for you, and you probably know what's coming. It's the most important question I can ask. Do you like pineapple on pizza? Love it. It definitely belongs on pizza. <laughs> Very good. So you're one that'll order the Hawaiian, yeah? Yeah. I just offer a little bit of a tangent. A, a, one of my best mates owns a pizza shop. All right. Um, and he doesn't think pineapple belongs on pizza. So I'll go in there and order. He might be Italian, so he's probably got good reason. <laughs> no, he's, he's Lebanese. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he, but he hates pineapple on pizza. So sometimes I'll just walk in there and I'll be like, hey, can I grab this pizza? And it doesn't have pineapple on it. I'll be like, but can I get pineapple? Yeah. Or I'll be like, can I just get a cheese and pineapple pizza just to razz him up? 
<laughs> but uh, yeah, I think it, it definitely belongs on even burgers. Burgers, the other one. People. Uh, it's got to be on a burger. Definitely. Yeah, it's got to be on a burger as well. I don't. I don't know. I don't know why people hate it. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm all about it on a burger. I'm less fussy if it's not on a pizza, or I'll, I'll eat it. If it's on a pizza and there's nothing else, I'll eat it. I probably wouldn't go and order it though. Yeah, like just cheese and pe- and pineapple pizza. Yeah, no, that that I probably wouldn't go that far. Yeah. I've never done it, but I'd go in there to order it. Like he would also I'll do I'll get kebabs from him and like different things. And I'm like, oh, can you just chuck some pineapple on that for me? Actually, pineapple on a kebab would be great, I think. I didn't like it. No. So I, I yeah, I got one and I didn't like it. And so when I went back there, he was like, All right, how'd the how'd the pineapple on the kebab go? And I was like, No, yeah, now you just take it off your pizza next time. <laughs> Uh, i might have to give it a go (laughs) yeah let me know like different taste buds yeah that's right right. that's right all right it's been absolutely wonderful uh chatting with you nathan and really good getting to to know you a lot better uh where can people find your work uh so the easiest place to find me is probably on instagram which is just at nathan godwin Uh, i do use facebook but not as much but that's nathan godwin photography but instagram is probably where i'm on the most perfect all right thanks very much Matt. no thank you thanks again for listening to landscape photography world i hope you enjoyed the show and keep listening because i'll be joined by some great guests in upcoming episodes you can find my work in this podcast at grantswinburnphotography.com i'm also on vero twitter youtube instagram and facebook i'm grant swinburne and hope to see you out shooting soon